Hi. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the last of the Farming Forward webinars. So uh, creating and monitoring functional landscapes funded uh, through the Australian government's Future Drought Fund. Um, and we work in partnership with the Tasmanian Farm Innovation Hub. So um, feedback's been great. To, and But what I was going to do tonight was I was going to skip through some of the slides. We've done a fair bit. Um, and then uh, and then just take uh, questions and and have a discussion and where to from here um, and just uh, see what people want to do. So I'll get into it. So um, just like to acknowledge the um, to traditional owners of the country we're presenting from, the Gunai Kurnai, where I am, and the um, and the Palawa. Palawa Kana, Palawa Pakana Pedogul, on whose land we uh, farm and gather in Tasmania. Um, this tool is a fantastic tool for talking to people about what we're trying to do. Uh, went and saw the uh, Common Ground um, video and things like that, and you know, people are struggling about whether it's the outcome or whether it's the practice. Um, you know, in rant, we're pretty sure that you've got to focus on the outcome of increasing landscape function, profit, and well-being. The tool that we find the most valuable to discuss and was really interesting, a couple that have just come back from Italy, had a, a holiday in Italy. They were so disappointed that so much of the land had no landscape function and uh, very... Uh, little birds, very little insects. So, you know, if you start to put these things together, uh, get that ground covered, you lead and build all that biodiversity. So it's the foundation of what we're trying to do. So the foundation of the landscape. Um, I've tried a new name, a uh, discussion with Celia on just um, not many people were liking, I've forgotten what the word, modulators, the word I had before. Um, so just I'll give this a run for a while and just see whether it works for people. So want something that shows that it's dynamic and adaptive and not levers, not tools. So just going to try connectors and see how it goes. Don't know whether it'll stay. Not sure that it will. But really what it... What we're trying to show in this slide, or what I'm trying to show, is that recovery impacts that soil surface, stock density impacts the soil surface, and utilisation impacts that. And I'll talk about what I was talking about in WA and stuff. So you change the soil surface to change the function of the land. So everyone's looking at the soil too much for me. Um, you know, they're looking, we've got to make the soil good to make the plants good, to make the food good, to make humans well. And I think we need to be saying, no, no, we ma manage the soil surface to improve the soil health, which include, and then it flows back up to healthy people, healthy land, healthy people. So I'm not a big fan of soil pits and it drives people especially the soil scientists, crazy. So it's a lot of evidence that that's the way it works. So just those five steps, you need people in on the land and working on the land and doing that shifting animals and maintaining stable rumens. You need trials to work on things. I think it needs to be pretty simple. It's got to be a simple breeding enterprise with grazing. You need a lot of paddocks per mob, so you're trying to keep it to one mob. You need that flexibility to adjust your paddock size and you need to be able to move water. I had to move water this afternoon and I was going, oh. Um, I was trying to get by, but they were 300 metres from the trough and they weren't drinking and I had to shift it so that they did. And then, you know, you've got to select the animals that you want. So one of the things that is really different about this is not changing the land to suit the animals you've got. It's changing the animals to suit the land we need. Not This isn't fluffy bunny stuff. 
this isn't it free for all and I can do what I feel. This is about what land do I need? We need it to be have high landscape function. You've got to get animals that suit that. So that is a, another restriction on what I do. Um, this was when it's really the argument started in Margaret River because there's hardly any perennial grasses in um, in southern Western Australia, so which is a pretty big block. Um, there's, there is out on the Nullarbor, but where you get into the grazing and farming, there's hardly a perennial grass. It's quite brittle. It's very seasonal humidity. Um, it's very Mediterranean. It's like California. They've lost all their perennial grasses as well. Um, and then people are really interesting. They then start arguing that they were never there. Never there. So, um, yeah, so I'm saying that's achievable everywhere, but it's not achievable if you don't change what you're doing and doing safe to fail trials. We need to remember about risk. It's about minimising losses, not maximising production. We need to remember about the definition of perennial grass recovery. When it looks like an ungrazed plant and contains fresh yellow litter, it's ready to be grazed. So then you monitor over time to see whether you've got enough litter and enough recovery that the soil's fluffing between grazing events because you've got to recover the soil as well as the plants because it gets compacted from the grazing, that, that high stock density that germinates the perennials and then the fibrous roots re-aerate the soil. Depends on temperature and soil. You need multiple linking up of grazing events to get that recovery. The purpose of grazing is to increase landscape function. Leaf emergence is well known, soil recovery is not. So you need to go past all the dairy grazing. You've got to start going that you're increasing landscape function. Um, I'll just put that in um, just, just out of one of Alan's books. And I was doing that slight decomposition and raw, raw litter and slight decomposition of a litter, um, just so that people had a bit of a visual. Um, I had a bit of an accident in the yards. There I am in casualty or emergency in the hospital in Bansdale, fractured the two joints, last two joints on my ring finger and pinky finger. It's got them squashed by a heifer trying to turn it around. So, but it's all good. And I've gone down to the minimalist sort of view now. So um, I couldn't, the plaster wasn't working for me. So I've taken the orthopedic path myself. Got back on Saturday from WA and was really tired, but they were going past this safe to fail trial area. Had my sore hand and, uh, and then I thought, oh, if I don't do it now, it's going to be hard. So it was looking pretty good. It's had about 18 months, um, this area. Yeah, it had good litter in it. Um, you know, sort of lots of material happening down on the soil surface. Um, lots of recovery, um, but I struggled to get them into areas small enough. So they had about a stock density. I wanted to do a 3,000 cows a hectare, and I just really couldn't do it with my hand and stuff. So I did about 1,000 um, uh, cows per hectare. This, I think... One of the the couple on the ramp on the Tuesday night said that they went and had their holiday in Italy and Europe and there was no birds and no insects. And I was really annoyed with myself when I hung up that I hadn't put the sound on because that was all the birds annoying me um, when I was doing this. What I was trying to do was do like a, a forest walk, um, you know, down at that grass level. Um, but I found it really hard because you sort of, I haven't got that other hand to lean on. So I, could, I was sort of sitting on my elbow and trying to crawl through with my camera. But, do you know, I wanted to do it like mimic people walking through a forest, a dense forest. Um, and I was trying to do that sort of but. I think it's a nice idea, but I just couldn't execute the other day. Um, so they weren't really dense when they went in. Um, that was sort of hard enough for me to get them in there. 
um, you know, sort of uh, just a bit tricky, um, but they were all pretty relaxed and uh, they uh, pushed, pushed in pretty well. It's completely different from the outside of the safe to fail trial area. And this is what it was like the, uh, the next morning. Um, the reason I didn't put the sound on yesterday is because I had my radio on on this one. So. And you can hear me grunting and groaning as I get up and down. On the fifth floor of the Justice Department building in Washington, D.C., J. Edgar Hoover was delighted with the newcomer. He was pleased that they were taking the communist threat. So what's the big difference between after the trial, like what was left behind from the trial and what's left behind with your normal grazing? Is it just the difference in the recovery period? Yeah, so it's effectively... Um, it typically is slightly higher um, stock density. So normally um, when we're going, we're doing about 2,000 cows a hectare. Um, so this was even a bit lower than that, um, but longer recovery. But sort of, it, um, you know, it sort of, they got it down sort of, but over a longer period. It won't germinate as much. They've probably been on it. So I left them overnight um, in there to to utilise it all. So I really struggled um, physically just to get it done. But I'm pretty happy. It'll it'll be, look all right and it'll come back okay. So um so might why, not have moved as far forward. So uh, so why why won't it germinate as much? Well, the higher the stock density, the more you you germinate more new perennial grasses. So there's a bit of a threshold over which you germinate perennial grasses and not every forb and weed, but it's it's not quite a step like that. So it's a bit more of a a a, a change, just uh, sort of loath to say sigmoid curve. But yeah, you need enough stock density that they actually walk on everything and scarify the seeds and create that soil to seed contact. And that germinates more. So the higher that stock density, uh, the more herd like the behavior, um, you actually need it to be high enough um, so that they're not looking where they're putting their feet and they were looking where they were putting their feet. So those watching them. So you want a stock density that it changes their behaviour. And as they get used to being in tighter and tighter, it goes up higher and higher. So Alan would create herd effect with um, attractants and herding, but Williams would turn them um, and use the turn to sort of also scarify uh, and chip that topsoil surface. So you've got to change that behaviour and it's the stock density that they start bumping one another. Um, you know, they're very aware of one another. So, um, and that's sort of not that, these animals are used to that stock density now. So you don't get as much of that um, behaviour change. So that's why I used to say a good way to demonstrate is to get everyone in the room, half the room, half the room, half the room, half the room, and eventually they start behaving differently because we all get within one another's um, space and we start being giggly and not being comfortable and doing all that. That's the sort of point that we're changing. Um, so it's not a fixed stock density. Um, it's increasing it and trying to do it as best you can um, to get that behaviour change. So... Um, and when those massive herds of wildebeest and diprotodon and uh, bison were going through the grasslands and elk in you know the steppes, they were going through the grasslands. They would be at that stock density that they were fighting to get fed. So um, yeah, it's just sort of that. So this is in when I went in twenty twenty over to WA and I took the caravan, and so this was the driveway of these people's property at Cogenup. And they said that you can't grow perennial grass, but the driveway was always all perennial grass 
but the paddocks were all annual. Now, this, this is really important, and it's about making people curious and highlighting the anomaly, why is there grass, perennial grass in the driveway and not in the paddocks? Well, in the paddocks, they were taught that three months recovery is a good, good recovery, a good starting point. And it obviously isn't in WA. So this is their driveway. This is their driveway. This is the farm I was working on. And this is all Phalaris, and it's in this weird patch that we tried to work out, well, why is it all there? But so what I did was I just tried to stimulate the group with those photos, and then I said, when we go out, the perennial grasses are going to be hiding in plain sight. Find out where they are, and then we'll, when we come back in, you can talk about where you saw them. So there was a tree belt that had perennial grasses in. There was a walking track that used to be an old railway that was all full of perennial grasses. So if the perennial grasses are in the driveways, the walking tracks, this area of a paddock, in those tree lines, then it's got to do with the management. It's not that there's no perennials or perennials won't, won't grow in WA. It's that they won't grow when you set limits, like I want three months recovery or I don't want to go to over a 1,000 cows a hectare or I don't want to go over a, you know 50% uh, utilisation. People set boundaries and then they go, oh, and then they start telling me, which is really interesting, the perennial grasses won't grow or that they were never here, which is what they say in California. So just be really aware that it's about doing the trials, exploring, well, where are they? Um, how do I get them to come back? But if if WA was all Phalaris, like, well, yeah, all that Southwest, so the walking track was from Margaret River down to a, another area, um, pretty nice spot. The, um, you know, if you can get, if you like that sort of thing. The, um, but, you know, like if it, this farm was like this, it'd just be fantastic. Do you know, I told them that I did do have a problem with Phalaris when it's dropped its seed. The cows would rather eat one another than eat the Phalaris when it's dried off and dropped its seed. So, um, and that's sort of that real brittle thing. Yeah, it had perennials, it had really good grass. So it'd be fine. Yeah, and they could then use that as a base to build something else. This is also from 2020. And this is, I was showing that Kaikuyu, it would keep love grass out. This is all love grass up here, love grass over here and love grass just on this side. Um, but they've then been grazing this area much harder and the love grass, the African love grass is starting to come in. And I think they're going to really have a big problem in WA because they have very few summer growing perennials and they don't like kaikuyu. And I, I kept saying to them, you're going to have to learn to love the kaikuyu. So very good. That was all I was going to do. How was that? Was that clear about that sort of, just that idea? Thanks. Okay. The, uh, that idea of, if it won't work, you've got to take that um, that approach that, well, how do I make, find out what does work? Because you can only make the business decision, does this management suit when you know what's required to regenerate the perennials? That's the point that you can say, I'm not going to do it. Oh, yes, I am going to do it. Or I'm going to slowly do it. Or I'm going to become a low-cost producer first and then focus on that. So in lots of our environments, we don't have many problems getting the perennials and maintaining them. Um, but, yeah, in these more brittle environments, you do. So more seasonally humid, very Mediterranean. Very good. Okay, on to questions and answers. So uh, took a little bit longer than I planned, but there's plenty of time. So this is from Rob about... Jerseys and Frisians. So Jersey's crossed with Frisians, become very popular with dairy farmers lately. 
Many dairy farmers say they believe they have better health traits and are more fertile. Um, Jerseys are smaller in size than Frisians, which fits with that um, that cow health um, index that we talked about the other day, that they're smaller in size uh, and making it easier for them to put on condition, therefore to get in calf. I asked my dad if he thinks we should go to a Jersey cross and he said that he likes the Frisians because there's a lot more data on them and there's no reason we can't breed them to be smaller. Um, I agree with that. You know, you don't have to go to these outcrosses. You'd go to an outcross, like putting a jersey over them um, to speed up the change, Do you know. So the example I use is here. If I want those Herefords and some of the Angus we've got to be better, I'll get a much quicker response in one generation by outcrossing to the Mashona. But it doesn't mean I couldn't very hard to find um, those Angus and Hereford bulls that actually produce a smaller, more fertile, healthier, inherently fat, inherently fertile animal by doing um, by not doing an outcross. So, and um, yeah, so my thoughts are, Rob, that I'd definitely say that you could do it with Frisians. But you're going to have to go for a Frisian bull that's at the extreme size to bring the cows down quick enough. So you're going to have to do a trial. I don't see that as being a problem in the dairy. If you're doing all AI, why wouldn't you do 30 cows with an extreme small, um, an extreme small um, uh, bull? That would, have, would, that would throw those cows and sort of take them down a couple of um, and uh, frame scores really quickly and just see if it works or not. So, you know, like, are they healthier? Uh, but you'd need that, um, again, all those other selection traits from Johan and Jaime and that of, you know, that early maturing um, muscled and all that sort of stuff. So uh, on the Speckle Park, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I don't think that. I don't think of it as the genetics being diluted, diluted, but I just think that it was. It was a. It was a calf that shouldn't be allowed to breed. So Johan's whole theory is that that dominant male would be that early maturing, heavily muscled, big in the shoulders, big in the forequarter, that would breed most of the cows. Because of the way we manage, we don't put any of that competitive pressure in. So all those speckle park bulls get to breed when only the first, the cup, the top couple would have been breeding in nature. Do you know? So the reason we're sort of breeding and diluting and chasing weird things and getting animal health problems and too much, you know, maintenance energy is because we haven't got that competitive. So um, so Johan, he went through a stage of just saying, put all the, don't mark any of your, of your male drop, put them all out and, and work out, um, you know, like treat it more like nature. Um, at the time where he was living, they got the equivalent for steers as they did for bulls. So it sort of made sense. Whereas now he's saying with a lot of people, um, you're going to have to select a bit more, you know, the kilograms per centimetre hip height, early maturing, a high secondary sexual characteristics and all that. So um, I, I think that there's still some Jersey um, genetics around that have still got that inherent fat in them and haven't been over-selected for too much milk. There is still some of those around. And I'd even do a trial with one of those. So the research is clear. Moderate milking cows are the most profitable. So not the not the not don't bring in the gross income, but they are the most profitable. So I'd be looking for a moderate milking jersey, high early maturing. Um, do that same thing, kilograms centimeter hip height. I'd be doing that with the jerseys, and I'd do it, be doing a trial with the Frisians and an extreme version so that he brings those ones down so that you can see what they're like 
um, in a generation, do I want to do more of this or less of that? So um, they have been, oh yeah, they've, they've run into the same problems as the Frisians they, and the Merinos and the Angus and all those things. That They've been selected for things that aren't necessarily those surviving survivable traits. So too much milk in dairy, uh, too much wool, uh, too fine or too much wool in merinos, um, you know, growth rates too high in the Angus, that type of stuff. So not not surviving survivable traits or traits that allow them to survive. Um, there is an advantage in crossing the two breeds. Um, it's it's really just that hybrid vigor. I'm not sure. You'd have to select from what you got from that. Um, but you could eventually do the same thing just with the Frisians. So is that is that all right, Rob? Um, yeah, that's good. Thanks, Graham. Um, can you just explain the the hip height, height thing and um, why it's important? That's important with dairy cows as well, is it? Yeah, it's important with all of them. We've selected uh, for growth rate. So um, now we're shifting to maturity and fat. So we're chasing, especially in the cows, fat, uh, muscle in the bull. So high testosterone, um, although Neil on the ramp says it's not high, it's just what uh, it switches on earlier. So um, the switch for testosterone and maturity switches earlier. So he argues that it's not actually a volume thing. So yeah, so the 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 heifers are more uh are more fertile you, if you select them on kilograms per centimeter hip height. We've been trying to do this, and I, I actually wrote to um Johan's group on the WhatsApp, which is sort of a high-risk activity. Um it's very male, um, very male forum. Though it's good that Alini and a few other women are on it now. It seems to have moderated a bit. Um, yeah, so you you're using so Stephen Hobbs is. We were talking about this and how he can get an automatic reader that will then feed straight through into his uh, scale head on his auto drafter. Um, you know, when he's putting the, all the use through, he could do that and work out, you know, kilograms per centimetre hip height. The only problem was it was $30,000 for the reader. It, at the moment, we can't find an easy one. And then I thought, oh, I think I might be missing the point. It's not that you want to know all the use. You want to know that the sires that you're using have real high, um, a real high ratio of of height to weight so it's really the size that you need to know because the size will then throw that into the into the into the breeders as well so yeah so it works for dairy cows uh sheep and um and beef cows probably the same in goats i haven't checked or got any information on that but yeah so it's really you're selecting for that early maturing so johan does it all at sort of 12 months old on the bulls um, or adjusted for 12 months old. because um, Yeah, and then he uses that to determine. But, yeah, so you can do you could do that visually, though, knowing um, if you've got a similar group, you know which ones are going to have the highest weight for height. Um, it's only really if you want, you've got that many that you can't work out who's going to be good and who's going to be bad. So, yeah, I'd be doing the same thing. Uh, I'd be selecting the jersey genetics that you did a trial on. Uh, if you couldn't do, do the jersey, I wouldn't worry, but I'd try an extreme uh, an extreme Frisian bull that's got moderate milk, uh, positive uh, fat, and, um, and, and really, really good kilograms per centimetre hip height. Um, so the kilograms per centimetre hip height, height uh, the main advantage for that is fertility, is it? Yeah, and early maturity. So they tend, um, they tend to, there's, there's an impact of how much they've been fed a bit 
um, but not as much uh, when they're adjusted. But they they do it at 12 months because they're all weaning very early. So they're saying it's not mum's milk, whereas we don't wean until 10 months old. So, yeah, mum's milk has a big, big impact. So I'm still sort of mucking around with how we're going to do it and what we're going to do. But, yeah, I'd be looking at that um, and visually assessing. So which bull am I going to try here? Um, but I don't know. Do they give you frame score and weight on the AI data? Uh, yes. Yes, they do. They um they give all of that sort of information. Yeah, there's a lot yeah. of data. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd visually look at ones that you think are going to do it or you know, decide on some sort of frame score that you're going to search for and then just look for ones that that frame score that does it do an auto sort like a database on the AI? Yeah, I'm not really an expert on it. My dad is okay. uh, yeah. ha has a lot of expertise in it, but yeah, I can look into yeah. that. Yeah, because yeah, you could do a frame score. And, yeah, so weight per frame score rather than worrying about measuring hip height and then just use those balls or one of those balls to just see whether it's worthwhile or not. Yep. So, and what to measure is a really big thing, I, I reckon. So, um, cow energy value. Um, yeah. So, the cow energy value EPD, which is a US measure, is really it's only an approximation that they found that there's a link between the taller they are and the more milk they have, the more energy they need for maintenance so it really is maintenance energy so to put on weight they've got to satisfy all that energy first if you select for those taller cows with more milk they'll have bigger internal organs and just to run the dairy factory that is the cow she'll need more and more energy so it's not that she can't digest the fully recovered grass. There's not enough energy in it for her. So it's she can still digest it fully, but she can't get enough energy out of it to, to satisfy her need to run the milk factory. I think of it as running the milk factory, but it's really they have bigger livers, kidneys, lungs, all that sort of stuff. And even when they're not milking, they need more energy um, than a smaller cow um, to, uh, just, to, just to survive. Even if she's not growing a calf or not milking, just to survive, she needs more energy than the feed's got from that fully recovered grass. So it's a really important point that it's about that. It's about that sort of maintenance energy that she wants. Now, there is cows that don't fit this. So I've had cows like it. You know, they've been really big cows, but they've had incredible appetites and incredible um, bite rates. So in uh, Andre Voisin or Wazon's book, Grass Productivity, that's a genetic thing. The bite rate is really important. They only work for about eight hours a day, uh, cows, and he, they did a lot of study on dairy cows in New Zealand and France and on twins um, so that they could actually see that it was an inherited thing, this bite rate and things like that. So they some of those cows can cheat because they'll eat more than and... Uh, and uh, and eat faster as well, which I hadn't heard of until I read uh, Grass Productivity by Andre Boisson. So, yeah, it does. Uh, I just keep saying, yeah, most people, when they're feeding hay and silage, are losing money, um, and then, then they're trying to make money when they're eating grass in the paddock. So it's like... Um, it's like a lot of the abattoirs only made money for part of the year, and then they tried to make it up when in spring or you know when people wanted to buy pay more for meat and things like that so so it's that cow energy value is a, a maintenance energy um so what i've been trying to work out how to say this that 
if if you're feeding cows all year round, so I, I I've been trying to think how to draw it and I can't. So say the farm will carry a hundred cows without any hay and silage. So cow number one hundred and one now is being fully fed on hay and silage. So not only does she have to pay for all the machinery, all the feeding out, all the uh, locking up paddocks, all that sort of stuff, she's responsible. So she can never be profitable. Cow 101 can never be profitable. So what people do then is put in another couple of hundred cows to dilute the costs of making the feed hay and silage. And it's really dodgy thinking. We've got to think about the impact of board in feed. And I've got an article somewhere, but I couldn't find the one with the graph in it. So I, I tried for an hour or so and it just drove me nuts. So I'll have another go at, at trying to find that graph and send it around. But it's this, you've got to think about it in terms of if you weren't doing anything, uh, if you weren't making any hay and silage and fully fed the cows, the next cow that comes in has got to pay for all the capital cost of machinery, hay and silage. And all you're doing by adding more is just diluting that. And that's why we get a bit twisted in our thinking about what's the optimum stocking rate. There was a consultant in Warrnambool, I was at a bank day, um, and he was saying that uh, the ideal stocking rate is 1.8 cows per hectare in southwest Victoria. And I said, oh, does, is that related to milk price or rainfall? Because it's just ridiculous. Do you know, you cannot say what the optimum stocking rate is. This stocking rate changes on feed price, milk price um, and rainfall. Do you know, so we need to be really, uh, uh, really aware that our accelerator and break is our stocking rate, and that's what we've got to do. So, so the less milk a cow gives, the better able she is to digest mature grass. Yeah, the, or she needs uh, lower maintenance energy. So that that's true. But the less milk she gives, the less money she will make. What we find everywhere we go that the rate that she gives less milk is not as fast as the rate that the costs go down. So they're not equal dollar for dollar. So you can, and I've got the example up further, you can take 5% of the cows out and increase your profit by 15%. And that's what we see all the time. So the obvious first step with most dairies is to do a trial of taking 5% of the cows out. And then if that, makes more money, take another five out, makes more money, take another five out, makes less money, put that five back in. So it's about searching for that optimum for you for profit. And it's got too many variables for you to calculate it. You can only find it by doing the work and doing the trial. Um, yeah, so the higher, the more milk she gives, the higher feed costs are. And um, that was that... Uh, graph by um, Paul Bethune. He did his Nuffield Scholarship on dairy and he put a graph in his Nuffield Scholarship showing that the most profitable dairy cows are the moderate producers, not the high producers. Um, so yeah, so milk production um, and cow size. Yeah, I'd agree. You've got that right. Uh, it is a bit of a sweet spot, but it's lower than the advice that you're going to get. Um, from the dairy industry, um, which is a production, not a profit focus. So uh, I don't have any data on the profitability of feeing Hayden silage, um, but I'll try and dig out some that um, more of that. Uh, his name's Barry Riddler, is the economist, dairy economist from New Zealand that understands all this. So he's really good at that. Um, Yeah, what um what I was trying to do, so he was set stopped, and by the time July came around, they'd run out of any carryover feed and stuff, 
and they were only eating really short perennial ryegrass that had excess non-protein nitrogen in it. So it doesn't have true amino acids in it and it causes scouring. It causes excess ammonia in the bloodstream. It's all those things. So young grass is incredibly toxic. We know young lucens toxic. Uh, we sort of know young crops are toxic, oak crops and things, but we don't seem to worry that young grass is probably worse. So, yeah, so I really like this carbon nitrogen, but it's not just that ratio of carbon to nitrogen. It's if the nitrogen is in the wrong form. So it's acting more like urea rather than amino acids when that grass is really young. So, and we know that, um, a lot of animals have been killed trying to get them to eat um, dry grass by giving them urea to grow the grow up the population of the bugs in the rumen to eat the uh, the dry feed. Um, so it's not just that it's the wrong ratio; it's the wrong form that the nitrogen's in. But they don't measure: is it non-protein nitrogen or is it true amino acids? Um, so that green grass clippings is high in nitrogen, but it's uh, it's in non-protein nitrogen. And then, so there is a parallel here, but it's just, I'd just add that the nitrogen ain't nitrogen. Excuse me, and I think that's in um, uh, one of the articles it's got as well for in that book, Grass Productivity. So he was a dairy researcher, ran his own dairy farm in the 40s, 50s, uh, Andre Voisin in France. Um, yeah, so just, yeah, and that non-protein nitrogen goes into the room, goes across the room and wall as ammonia and is toxic in the blood. And then the animals work really hard trying to get rid of it and excrete it. It'll smell like ammonia in the dairy um, and they're using all their energy. It, it sort of blocks up the filters, the kidneys and the liver and things like that, uh, causes abscess on all of those sort of things on the livers, um, and uh, it lowers the fertility because it puts the, uh, the cows into negative energy balance um, because it's the wrong form of nitrogen. So, um, yeah, so composting and room and digestion and a lot of that sort of decomposing litter and life in the soil, they're all sort of, um, mimics of one another all the way up. So it's, uh, what do they call that? Um, some sort of fractal thing I'm trying to think of that it, it's a repeating pattern through all that. And they're finding it like, you know, as everyone knows about our digestion as well. Um, um, is there, uh, sorry, Graham, is there no, a, somewhere uh, where I can get some information on the effects of the uh the non-protein nitrogen crossing the room and wall and causing those health uh, yeah. problems yeah um, um like an jerry, yeah, yeah Jer jerry brunetti was really good at um and i i put up one of his slides at some stage i think of how that actually goes into the non-protein nitrogen a hundred percent of it goes becomes ammonia and goes across the room and wall. But yeah, Jerry Brunetti, he's dead now, but he, uh, but he treated, he would treat the symptoms by changing and adding you know, buffers to the room and, and things like that, rather than just give them older grass. So um, the dairy industry has been incredibly reluctant to try older grass. You know, uh, the cows aren't suited to it. Uh, they can't have the stocking rates they want, you know, and all the uh, all the researchers and that say it's all wasted if you have any litter at all in the base of the plant. So um, that's what you really need to do. But yeah, Jerry Brunetti uh, talks about that mechanism, and I, he used to have videos online as well. So I'll try and dig out some stuff if you can't find it, Rob. Yeah, my dad's actually a fan of Jerry Brunetti, so uh, yeah. yeah, it's good. I, I really liked him. So he he actually understood this a, 
a lot. So I went to a few of his things and stuff like that. But, he, yeah, he was a gun. So, uh, But not addressing the cause, which is the, reco the, the recoveries were too short or the, the rounds are too short. So, um, so I had Mark Bader come to our farm who's trained – who trained Jim Elizondo about the oxygen and hydrogen. I think it's a little bit too complicated for farmers. That was in, oh, you know, late 90s. Uh, Mark Bader was, uh, his father's name was Baden Bader, which who would have thought you'd do that to your child? Um, but Mark Bader really was good about this sort of nutrition and things like that. But again, they would put out supplements and things like that to balance the oxygen and hydrogen and things like that. I tried all those things, free choice minerals um, from free choice enterprises, which was the name of it. And they were very good about doing the oxygen and hydrogen. So the, And the carburetor, I, I loved it as an analogy. It just worked for me. Um, but yeah, we really, I'm saying that you need to stabilize their rumens on the feed that's fully recovered and then monitor the dung scores. So rather than trying to thinking about how am I going to balance the oxygen and hydrogen, just use their gut fills and dung scores to run it. And uh, we find that works really well. Do you know? So I went down this path of all the supplements. I was at the time I was spending, oh, I can't remember the, the, it was like 300 bucks an acre on free choice minerals and that was as much if not more than if I was fertilizing so um it really financially it didn't work for me and stuff and you know we talked a lot about it Mark Bader and I so um but yeah I tried all that and then coming back to dung scores and gut fills is the best so um yeah is that all right anything else Rob no that's excellent thanks Graham the um, I won't talk about this, but this there's this point that as you increase that stocking rate, there's a point that all of a sudden you go from that slope of the graph to that slope of the graph. In this paper, the Hill Farm paper, they talked about productive variable costs and corrective variable costs. I would call these profitable variable costs and corrective variable costs. But there's a point, and that point generally is when you have to start bringing feed onto the farm. And that maximum sustainable output was what they found to be where that point where you have to start bringing feed in. But because they were shedding them over winter and things like that, they, had, they made hay and silage and things like that. So. It is a pristine brain, isn't it? So, um, the Jerry Brunetti link that Celia's put on. So, there's lots and uh, lots online, YouTube's and whatnot yeah. of him. Yeah, I I think he's really good about that, and I'll I'll include in the notes the Jerry Brunetti slide. But one of the reasons I'm always reluctant to go into that in too much detail is that people start thinking about that rather than looking at the dung scores and the gut fills. They want to know more about that sort of stuff. We seem to love uh, the detail rather than the management, and I, I'm just trying to stick to that. And this I've just put in again, Rob, um, yeah, reduce the cow numbers by 5%, increase the profit by 15%. So it wasn't just that they were overstocking, um, milk production actually increased by reducing the numbers. So a lot of these genetics are not getting fed fully. Um, you know, so they're designed and bred a lot of the cows and dairy cows that I've seen for fully fed with, you know, you know uh, what do they call it? TMR, total mixed ration. Um, and th th there really is an issue with that. So, um, oh, I've taken up too much time. Hidden costs of bought-in feed. I'll just let you read that, but that's about that. Uh, it's only by averaging it out. So um, 
it's only by averaging it out over more numbers that feeding makes sense. And the sup it's not supplementary feed. It's only supplementary if it's on the shoulders of the season. Um, and this was uh, from Spikey, uh, getting new mothers to eat more. Um, I always wake the calf up and make it walk with, when I'm shifting um, the cows, I wake the calves up from day one and make them walk up with mum. So eventually, and I always, you know, I end up always saying, calling out, come on, bubbies. And I want to I want to get a little bit more macho than that. It's not cutting it for me. So I'm going to try, come on, calfies. But for some reason, that doesn't work for me. Um, but I make them move and I give them a voice prompt. Um, and within a fortnight, a lot of them will wake up to the voice call um, and they'll be grumpy because you've woken them up. Uh, and they'll come up and they'll be you know, moaning and whinging. But you want them to move with mum. You've got to get that back into it um, so that mum doesn't think she's got to stay back with them. And it's really, uh, it's really important, uh, especially um, this is grey cow, isn't it? So I'm thinking, you know, she probably has too much milk. She's going to have to eat. You're going to have to really... Uh, make sure she moves and eats and stuff all the time. So it's really train the calf to move. Uh, don't let it um, sleep miles away. That's been selected for them. That was, you would have always ended up as being, um, you know, um, Tasmanian tiger bait if you'd stayed um, too far away. So they should be with them. They will, they are very trainable um, and they'll, within a couple of weeks of you doing that, every time you shift them, they'll move when you call them and they'll come to you when you call, which is really good. So. Is that all right, Lawrence? Yeah, that's good. I think yeah. what we're struggling with at the moment is Spoke's trying to supplementary feed her, but she's in with a whole lot of others who see her coming with the bucket. So. No, no, sort of. <laughs> yeah, not easy at all, so. So that took a little bit longer than I thought. Sorry. I hope that was all right. Any other comments and questions, thoughts? Um, hope it made sense. I was rushing. So I'm really happy to take emails and and any comments and questions and thoughts and you know, any of those sort of like that that's some great questions and they inspire me to sort of go looking. Um for things so yeah so anything in the next five minutes or should it oh excuse me yeah sure Jen. um i was just this is related to the webinar but i was i have to do it i'm doing a school project around regenerative agriculture and i'm doing a yeah. podcast as, as a part of it yeah would you be wanting to be on it yeah for sure That'd be great. Yeah, good. Yeah, yep. Just if you got my email, Jen. Yeah. Oh, you too, Celia. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'd love to. That'd be. Yeah. It's a great project, I, Jed. Yeah. yeah. We're sort of pretty keen on um. Pretty keen on any of that sort of stuff, Jed. So. Yeah. Um, I don't know what you can see or what you can't, but I'll include that slide as well, um, Rob. So that's one of Jerry Brunetti's. So it's got a lot of stuff in it. So and it's this overflow ammonia that causes all the anemia, pathogens, lowered immunity, um, and other things that it causes. So. Uh, yeah, that, that'd be great. And um, anything with that, any of our, with my slides and stuff, Jeff, you know, if you want to put them in the project, like, mm -hmm. you know, this is the definition that Rant uses, Do you know, the Regenerative Ag Network of Tasmania uses, you can use all those as well. So anything you want to do, so. Um, Very good. Question, Graham, the comments about uh, the non-organic nitrogen and rumen does that also 
is it also the case with the other hindgut fermenter herbivores? Yeah, definitely. It is also the yep. same. Yeah. 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 And it, and it, you know, that's what I'd always end up fighting with the vets about. You know, they, they're designed to eat large volumes of, of very low quality tucker. That's what they got. They, they need, they need lower quality tucker than the ruminants, but we tend to feed them higher quality than the ruminants. So I'd be, I, you know, but then the level of work comes into it on how much energy they need. A bit like having those higher maintenance energy, bigger milking cows and sheep and stuff. So you've got to balance that up a bit. So yeah, I mean there were this last year or something. There were lots of reports of like there were hay shortages or people getting hay from unusual places and nitrogen toxicity being an issue in the equine area, you know, oh New South Wales, Victoria. It was yeah. a year or two ago. Yeah. I I always you know, worry about some of the, the logic and stuff, but it sort of um whenever I saw people that were complaining, and that's only a smallish sample, um, of complaining of the uh, the sugars in the ryegrass hay and things. You you would have heard all that sort of stuff, Kirsten. Yeah. Once we went there, they were on a paddock of grass that was like short pit that they were eating as well. And I, I'd go, well, take them off that and see whether it is the hay or, or whether it's the, the non-protein nitrogen in the short pig. So, yep. um, so yeah, when I'm when I'm in Tasmania, I talk about you know eating short pick is a is a Victorian sport. When I'm in Victoria, I say that Tas in Tasmania, eating short pick. So I swap it around depending where I am. So chicken. <laughs> oh. Graham, Graham, I just wanted to say thanks very much. It's been uh, and and Celia, of course, uh, it's been such a fascinating. Um, webinar series and really haven't been able to make it every week but I've I've listened to them all online if I haven't made them and yeah just really appreciate you sharing all your information with us so yeah right it's, it's I'm not going to not know what to do with myself on a Wednesday night now so yeah <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have to find other learning opportunities it's been really yes. great, sort of oh, reaching well I think I, I like that <laughs> oh. Oh. hey puss yeah, yeah, that's Basil. Get hold of him. Get hold of him. Get hold of him, Weepix. Get hold of him. Basil <laughs> the bastard. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, we'll have to work out whether we can get something else funded and things like that. So, yeah, we'll, uh, do that. But yeah, so stay in touch and um, yeah, drop us questions and feel free just to drop me the three bullet points anytime you want. So. No, thanks so much. I really... Yeah, it was just great. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks, Kay. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks everyone. Yeah, it was good. Thanks for it all. Thanks. Yep. And, uh, we'll be in touch, Rob. So, yeah. 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 Thanks, um, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Julia. Oh, thanks, thank you're very welcome. Thanks, and a, a final acknowledgement to the um, Tasmanian Farm Innovation Hub for for funding this through the Future Drought Fund. So, yes. yep. it's enabled. Yeah. Never before have we run twenty three. Um, successive webinars so that's it's been a, a, a game changer yeah, so we're grateful for, for sure. that so excellent we'll try and replicate it yep yep okay okay thank Thanks you all thank you bye bye, bye. 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 bye.